everyone. Thank you for having me back. It's a pleasure to have you today, Manash. And the weather has changed, which is the cold temperature. It's usually we're staying in front of the water. And then Friday, we wake up to the snow. So, schedule for us. All right, so we're going to go ahead and get started. Our first speaker today is Dr. Peter Lindemann from Edinburgh University. And talking about the population status of the Pearl Map. Good morning, and thank you all for making it out this morning. Uh, I'm delighted to be here to talk about uh, some final conclusions we brought on uh, from some work that I was doing from 2015 to 2018 with my co-authors on uh, these two turtle species, the Pearl Black Turtle of Pearl River in Mississippi and southeast corner of Louisiana, and then this is the Pascoola Black Turtle of southeastern Mississippi. The pearl map turtle lives only in the Pearl River and its tributaries, and the Pascagoula map only in the uh, Pascagoula River and its tributaries, so uh, one river drainage to the east. These two species were long considered to be the same species uh, in 1992. The two of them together in their two river drainages in the city split away from a species known as Japanese pulchra in Alabama in the Mobile Bay drainages. And then it went until 2010, they were finally recognized as two separate species based on morphological and, and genetic analyses. Uh, because of that taxonomic history, there's been uh, a little bit of a lag in getting the conservation attention that these species need. But they were part of a lawsuit a few years ago that was diversity over 400 aquatic species from the southeastern United States that they viewed as being uh, uh, not reviewed in a timely matter, manner for a, a federal listing under the Endangered Species Act. And so they were uh, uh, two of the 300 and some of those species that the Fish and Wildlife Service finally decided they were in fact going to review for listing. And that's how I got the funding to start my studies in uh, 19 or in uh, uh, 2015. So, from uh, my book uh, at the range within the Pearl River drainage for Graptomys pearlensis, the Pearl River map turtle, uh, and then also in the Pearl River is the ring sawback Graptomys oculift, and then this is the the Pascagoula River system, the Pascagoula main stem here, plus the two major tributaries, the Chickasahay and the Leaf River for Graptomys gibbons eye, also living in that same river drainage would be Graptomys flavimaculata, the yellow. You can see that the two map turtles are somewhat more uh, broadly distributed than the sawback species which is good information because the sawbacks have been listed on the uh, endangered species list as threatened for some time, since 1986 for the sawback and since 1994 the yellow blotch sawback. Uh, historical data on the, these species, uh, this mostly in terms of the mallets that would be whose feet Males' heads that are adaptations per saw in front of the researcher uh, presented some data in 1958 that said uh, you had fairly equitable ratios. Bill Clyburn at Southern Miss uh, took his students out to several spots all over both of these river drainages, the Pearl and the Pascagoula, and uh, there's a look at what he found slight discrepancies between what he reported in the literature and what's actually in the Mississippi Museum where he deposited his specimens, but somewhat equitable ratios of megacephalic species, the two listed sawbacks again. Uh, Dick Vogt in, uh, that should say 1978, uh, 1958, 1978, very equitable ratios. I did some studies at all of these lettered spots back uh, times per spot to count basking turtles in 1994 and 1995, 
and a couple of publications in 98 and 99, and look at how the megacephalix per sawback, per sawback has fallen. If I take the megacephalix per sawback and put, put that all together on the next slide, uh, my data suggests a decline as of the end of the 20th century compared to the 70s, 60s, and 50s from these uh, previous studies. Uh, and so that, those, that was the first indication that there might be some need for uh, listing of the megacephalic species in addition to the sawback. So I got funding to go down 2015 through 2018 and take a look all over these river drainages. And so I loaded up my car with my canoe and my John boat, canoe for smaller streams and the John boat for the bigger streams and a lot of traps. Uh, there I am out on the boat getting ready to set some traps for turtles. The main trap that worked the best was basking traps. So you put a basking trap underneath uh, a spot where these turtles like to sun themselves. Uh, species in the genus Graptomies like to sun uh, and, and bask more than I think any other turtle species in the world. So these work really well. Here's a yellow blotch sawback who is not quite crawled up high enough to fall into my trap, but she's thinking about it. And uh, uh, we also did uh, a lot of basking surveys where we would drive all over the river drainages of southern Mississippi and walk out on bridges to look for basking turtles. And then we did uh, basking density surveys where we could cruise a portion of a river in our canoe or in the uh, uh, John boat and count turtles with high-powered image stabilizer binoculars and see what we were seeing. Uh, with the data from these sorts of surveys, you can look at just the sheer numbers you're seeing per bridge count or the sheer numbers you're seeing per kilometer, the density of basking turtles. But you can also look at relative abundance of species and take each of the graptomy species uh, as a, a percent of all all turtles, or just look at the graptomies ratios, look at the megacephalic to sawback ratio. So there is to look at the data and uh, yeah, of what the situation is for the species. So here's a look at point counts PC versus is basking density survey, surveys, DDS, where we're actually cruising a portion of the river. So the point count would be a, uh, and, and the, the yellow will be you know, throughout all my slides, yellow will be for the Pearl River drainage, and orange will be for the Pascagoula River drainage. The lowest Part of the bar here, the, the uh, darkest color, is for the megacephalic species. And what I want you to notice is, is the percent of megacephalic, whether you're on the main stem river, large, large tributary in the river, or small, smaller tributaries that join the tributary, regardless, you get equal relative abundance there, variation, yellow and orange are for the sawback, big wide rivers of the community that depends on the river, so smaller tributaries don't work, work really well for their ecology, but sawbacks are main stems and pop off quite a bit. Uh, and would be things like red sliders and river cooters and uh, moss turtles and soft shell turtles. And they're pretty low in relative abundance, dominating. But then once you get to the uh, picks up quite a bit. Really like Our two focal 
species of fish candidates for federal listing. Uh, and what diagrams is that uh, regardless of uh, the eye does a little bit better. Uh, this is true of the podcasting density counts or the river in our and three oculifera from Pearl River, and here's a bucket of ten Gibbons eye. I don't have any shots of ten Pearl Ansys in one bucket because we never caught them at that sort of a rate. Uh, you can see that the Gibbons eye captures the Pearl Ansys captures. Uh, relative abundance, this is the ring of Gibbons eye out of us, uh, uh, Pearl Ansys in this metric as well. So in the past Google River, things are going better. Go in and have to trace all the way up all the uh, main stem rivers and all the tributaries. The highest point on each tributary, where we so these are uh, of our two species. The main stem Pearl River, 633 kilometers. For the Pascagoula, I counted. Uh, not only the Pascagoula River down here, but the Leaf River and the, the uh, Chickasahay River as main stems, and it comes out to 623 river kilometers, almost exactly equal for the two species in main stems. Uh, the tributaries is where things become really different. 647 river kilometers occupy in, in the Pearl, but 1,111 last to Gula. Uh, so percentage-wise, it's almost an even mix of main stem for the Pearl. It's almost a two-to-one ratio in the Pascagoula system of, of, of tributaries to main stems. Total river kilometers very different. 1,280 versus 1,730 that difference in tributaries that are occupied. Uh, whoops. So, uh, part of my uh, I'm in again. Uh, so, habitat for given by, but Pearl and the ground. Christmas tree. Use fragile scientists that to it uh, compared to the Pascagoula, which looks a lot bushier. And I think that's very relevant for the conservation situation of these turtles because uh, uh, tributaries could be a very valuable refuge from some of the things affecting the river ecology of these species. Uh, and this, this slide color-coded portions of the two drainages where the, the warm are higher basking densities and the cooler colors are lower basking densities. And we said, why don't we assign full values of basking top line, high basking density, medium, low, we can make an assumption from uh, some of the work that some of my co-authors have done suggest you typically see around 15% of the population you are doing your cruise down the river. You're seeing about 15, 55% of them are down the water doing something else. Uh, and from population estimates, throughout the drainage, we think there are somewhere in the order of 21,841 Pearlensis. Map turtles, 61% on main stems in the larger tributes, and just 6% uh, We think that Gibbons Eye, on the other hand, with its much greater range length and, and more occupied tributaries, 
uh, and also a higher uh, basking density overall. 34,080 of them, 57% on main stems, 25% on large tributaries, and they just have a lot more in the way of smaller tributaries that they occupy, so 18% there. Uh, so there's a, uh, a difference in the population estimates according to whether it's main stems or large or small tributaries. So again, better it would appear for Gibbon's eye than for Perlensis. Uh, we did document a number of range extensions. Everything within one of these ovals is was unknown habitat for the species to 2015. Uh, so it came out to 188 new river kilometers occupied by Perlensis. That's 15% of their range length, but because it's on tributaries, it's only 9% of their global estimated population. For uh, for Gibbons Eye and the uh, Pascagoula River, 133 new river kilometers. That's 8% of their total that was unknown prior to 2015. But 4% of their global estimated population, because again, it's on smaller tributaries where the densities are a lot lower. This is the point because another megacephalic gravity is grafted to the Eye from Georgia Panhandle and a little bit of Alabama was really listing the rationale that they gave for doing was that they found that they lived in. We think that, but very populations are very low density populations, so as much to the population as uh, a good main would do. So our recommendations for listing. Uh, we think that, that the, the uh, Perlensis map, uh, the Japanese pearl map turtles certainly qualify. It's surely more threatened than the ring sawback, which has, has been listed as threatened since 1986. Uh, as far as Gibbon's eye, we could list Gibbon's eye as threatened as well, which would recognize, if you think back to the historical data, uh, would recognize seem to have declined relative to sawbacks. So that are already listed, their populations are clearly much better <coughs> off uh, Perlensis populations in the Pearl River. So one of the suggestions floated is this is threatened by, by similar uh, uh, for these various forms of pet degradation. Additional threats is uh, the pet trade, and we've had 30 years of the sawbacks being listed and protected against the pet trade whereas uh, uh, these species are still being collected. So they could be listed as threatened by sirens, which would focus all the recovery efforts <coughs> on Perlensis, the species that needs recovery effort, efforts arguably more, uh, more so. So uh, certainly one new threatened species and then the other species either threatened or threatened by similarity of uh, appearance. So I'd like to thank all my students who have helped me uh, throughout uh, the four years of this project and also the Fish and Wildlife Service for providing the funding. And if we have any time, I'll take any questions you might have. Well, main stems, it's, it's pretty uh, pretty easy on the main stems. You have a, on the inner bends of rivers, big flat sandbars that they're crawling up and using. And uh, people have, nobody's done a directed study of reproduction in either of these species. Uh, they've done some with uh, oculifera, a little bit with flabmaculata, but, but we know they nest on inner bend, inner bend uh, uh, sandbars on the main stem rivers. As you go up into some of the smaller tributaries, larger tributaries will have sandbars that are a little bit smaller. 
But as you go up into some of the smaller tributaries, we see them in some places where there's hardly a sandbar to nest on. So it's a very interesting question. And one of the questions I have is when I see uh, the megacephalics way up the small tributaries, are they there seasonally and when it's time to nest, do they have to go downstream and go find a wider river with big sandbars? Or are they just crawling up the banks into the forest and nesting in a much more shaded location? That, uh, if, uh, if these species do get listed, that'll be one of the things that I think uh, will need to be determined to, uh, to uh, move forward with, with their conservation. I guess this kind of expands from that. Um, you mentioned the conservation risks to these species being um, pet trade and habitat degradation. Right. What, uh, do you have any details on what specifically the degradation is we, that leads to a conservation impact to them? We don't know for certain. There's been some river engineering on the Pearl River. There's a large reservoir right in the uh, middle of the main stem near the city of Jackson and there's been some river engineering and channelization in the lower part of the pearl. They're mollusk dependent. The big females with their big wide heads, uh, those are adaptations for crunching up snails and, and mussels. Uh, so a lot of that uh, prey base may have been uh, impacted by, uh, by river engineering, by sedimentation from agriculture and other forms of land clearing. Uh, but there has not been as yet a directed study to show that. What are Mississippi's regulations on turtles generally? Uh, they actually <coughs> allow the, the personal possession, not commercial sale, but personal possession of four of uh, each of these, the, each of the megacephalics. Of course, the uh, the sawbacks are off limits, have been since 86 and 90. Uh, personal possession of up to four for uh, the, the two map turtles, the megasphalic map turtles. So listing would uh, shut that down, which would be good. presentation is Chloe Finger from Allegheny College and she will be presenting on determining the effects of forest fragmentation on the eastern red-backed salamander. <coughs> Global amphibian populations have been declining rapidly um, and at a rate that is higher than any other vertebrate group in the world. In the last two decades alone, uh, 168 species have been lost to extinction, and that's 200 times the natural extinction rate. So amphibians are suffering, and research needs to be done to figure out why, what's causing this decline, and how we can help. Existing research points towards pollution, climate change, disease, invasive species, and habitat degradation as the main contributors to this population decline. So, my study organism. This is Plothodon cinereus, or the eastern red-backed salamander. They belong to the Plethodonte family, which is terrestrial salamanders. And they make a good study organism because they are very prevalent in the forested areas around this, around the northeastern United States, and they're easy to find, and they're also, they also play an important role in their ecosystem. They are the most abundant terrestrial salamander in the northeastern United States. They are indicator species, which means that people use 
the abundance of them to assess the health of an ecosystem. So if there's a high abundance of eastern redback salamanders, it means that this forest ecosystem is in good health, and if there's a low abundance, it usually means that it's not as healthy. They are apex predators, which means that they play a large role in the food web. They eat invertebrates, and they have a role in decomposition and nutrient cycling. And if they were to be removed from that ecosystem, it could cause a trophic cascade that would radiate throughout the food web. They are lungless, and they respirate cutaneously, which means that they breathe through their skin. Um, and in order to do that, they need moisture and a very specific set of abiotic conditions. They're also exothermic, which means that they're very sensitive to temperature changes as well. They live in hardwood forests across the northeastern United States, um, and when conditions are right, they like to hide under rocks and logs and in leaf litter, um, but if it's too hot or too dry or too cold, then they bury themselves underground. So habitat fragmentation, what is that? Essentially, it's when a continuous <coughs> habitat is broken up into distinct pieces by human development, whether that be a road or a parking lot or a housing development, it's just any human construction that separates a habitat into several different pieces. And what that does is it isolates populations. So especially for something as small as a salamander, you can imagine a road provides a decent barrier to their movement. And so instead of it being one big population, Habitat fragmentation breaks these populations up into smaller little groups that can't access each other anymore, which means that the genetic diversity of those smaller groups uh, decreases, and over time that leads to decline in the population and potentially extinction. Uh, habitat fragmentation also introduces edge effects. Um, so if you imagine a forest that's never been touched and then um, a paved road through the middle. In order to pave that road, you need to cut down trees, which introduces sunlight, and that sunlight will warm the air, it will warm the soil, and it will decrease soil moisture. And all of those things negatively impact salamanders. So, the goal of this study is to determine if habitat fragmentation has a negative impact on Plepidon scenarios. So, for my methods, I decided to compare two types of fragmentation to core forest. So, I compared paved roads to hiking trails to core forest. And I categorized core forest as anything that was 80 meters away from any sort of, any type of fragmentation. So to set up my transects, I set them parallel to my type of fragmentation, five meters away, and my transects were five meters by 50 meters. And then my core transects, I set up parallel to, not, to one another with five meters in between, and I made sure that there was 80 meters around those transects of um, uninterrupted forest. Once my transects were set up, I would mark them and then walk across them in a zigzag pattern. Um, to control for my movements, and I would overturn any rocks or logs that I found in my path, and then look for salamanders underneath those. If I found any, I would collect them, ID them, measure them, and then release them back. And as I went along, I counted how many cover objects I turned over. I also collected several abiotic factors per transect, so I measured air temperature, soil temperature, leaf litter depth, the number of days since the last rain event, and leaf litter moisture. And in order to assess leaf litter moisture, I collected three samples per transect and put them in Ziploc bags and then brought them back to the lab where I weighed them and then dried them and then weighed them again to assess the moisture content of those samples and therefore of each transect. All of these all of my data was collected on days that were really wet, so either during rain or right after rain, and they were all collected from three different sites. Um, 
that are all generally the same mix of hardwood trees. So these are my initial results. This graph is showing salamander abundance by fragmentation type. And I found statistical significance between my road transects and my core transects, and also between my trail transects and my core transects. But I did not find statistical significance between my road and my trail transects. I found, <clears throat> overall, I found five salamanders in my road transects, 15 in my trail, and 53 in my core. Other anticipated findings, um, I'm not entirely done processing all of my data. I have 90 samples of leaf litter to weigh, dry, and weigh, and then I also have all of that abiotic data that I collected, and so I'm not entirely done analyzing that yet. Um, but initially, some of the factors that are springing up as the m having the heaviest weight on salamander abundance, um, the first one being leaf litter moisture. So generally the transects that have wetter leaf litter also had more abundance. The second being leaf litter depth. So my core transects had um, deeper leaf, leaf litter depth than my other transects and that just m might be because there's more trees in, in those core areas and there might just be more leaf litter there, but it's something to note. And then temperature also plays a large role in how many salamanders I found. I definitely found more abundance of them on days when it was cooler. And those things make sense given um, P. cinerus's sensitivity to these abiotic conditions. So habitat fragmentation has a large negative effect on P. cinerus abundance, and it's likely that these impacts span to other species as well, especially other species of terrestrial salamanders, um, because population isolation, barriers to movement, and edge effects all provide the same challenges across the board. Um, they are in, these factors increase the likelihood of extinction and definitely should be taken seriously as contributors to the global amphibian decline of populations. Any questions? I was intrigued by your mention of a trophic cascade. Mm -hmm. uh, if, if red back salamanders were lost, what would we see maybe in that habitat in their absence? It's unclear. I've looked into this a decent amount, and people say that there might be trophic cascades, but they're not sure exactly what that's going to cause. Um, usually, people cite things like it, it will change decomposition and um, the invertebrates that they eat. There will be more of those, obviously. So. Okay, thank you. Um, how many transects? Forgot to mention that I did tran 10 transects per fragmentation type, so 30 overall. Did you walk at all your transects? So your 10 transects and your three habitat types. Did you do them all on the same day? No. Um, it was. It took too long to set them up and to walk them and to collect everything. But I did try and do them on days that had similar conditions. Mm -hmm. under two centimeters, really small. Yeah. Were, was there any difference in the kinds of cover objects at your different distances away from the road? Um, a little bit, yes. Uh, in the core forest, there were more cover objects um, because there were more like branches and down trees and things. Um, in terms of type, it was all mostly branches, some rocks and that was consistent across all three. Yeah, it's tempting to, since you mentioned there, there were more cover objects, when you're analyzing your data, you might want to try an analysis where you kind of correct your numbers mm -hmm. based upon the 
density of cover objects yep. and that might be an interesting result. And it's true that the core uh, transects, there were a, a high number more of cover objects there, mm -hmm. so. University, and she is presenting on investigating mortality of gizzard shad. <coughs> well, good morning, everybody. Um, my name is Emma Mater. I am a senior environmental science major at Mercer's University here in Erie, Pennsylvania. And today I'm going to be talking to you about investigating mortality of gizzard shad due to viral hemorrhagic septicemia, or VHS, associated with warm water discharges in the Great Lakes. So first I'd like to talk about the fish of interest. This is it here. This is the gizzard shad or the Dorosoma sapeniatum. It's a small warm water member of the herring family that's native to the eastern slope of North America. Though it's an open water species, it tends to migrate into shallow waters and warmer waters to breed. It's most abundant in Lakes Ontario and Lake Erie in relation to the Great Lakes. And something notable about this fish species is that it's sensitive to temperature changes. So a temperature change of roughly 3 to 4 degrees Celsius is enough to put the gizzard shad into thermal shock, which is when a fish goes into shock due to a temperature change. Thus, winter kills of gizzard shad have been observed since the 1940s, and they're nothing new. Um, and I personally have been observing them since 2017. The virus of interest, as I said, is viral hemorrhagic septicemia, which is it's a deadly virus that some people consider the Ebola of the fish world. So some key signs of it is the bloodiness and bleeding from the scales, hence the name hemorrhagic, it's like a hemorrhaging kind of thing. Also the bulge of the eye that you can see in this silver bass right here is also a key sign. So it's such a deadly virus because it spreads across all different kinds of fish species. So when it was first recorded in the Great Lakes in 2005, it has affected over 40 fish species in, throughout the Great Lakes. Um, gizzard shad particularly die-offs due to VHS were first recorded in Michigan in 2006, and the first confirmed case of VHS gizzard shad die-off for Pennsylvania in Lake Erie um, was found in March 2019 by myself and Dr. Campbell. Our samples that you can see here were sent off to John Cole of the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service from the Fish Health Center in Lamar, Pennsylvania on March 14, 2019, where he confirmed that VHS was the culprit of this fish die-off. So the purpose of this presentation is to provide a detailed description of the 2019 gizzard shed die-off, offer a hypothetical explanation of how environmental circumstances can affect the mortality, and evaluate whether similar circumstances could explain other episodes of winter gizzard shed die-offs at other Great Lakes sites. So our story begins at the Erie Coke Corporation here in Erie, Pennsylvania that was established in 1901, so it's been in operation for over 100 years. This top figure one here shows you with the yellow arrow where Erie Coke is in relationship to Presque Isle, and here we are. And then figure two zooms in with Erie Coke in the corner and the East Avenue boat launch. So Erie Coke is located on the east side of Erie. Specifically, this little cove right here, you can also see in this picture. And the reason why this cove is our area of interest is because Erie Coke has a warm water discharge stream that enters into Lake Erie, flowing roughly through this area right here. So this is video shows you a typical day at the warm water discharge stream. This is the stream right here that's entering out of the factory. Um, the fish that are swimming up it are gizzard shad. We believe that this behavior is caused by their need to go into warm water and swim upstream to breed. Um, but when we came down here, we noticed that there was a vast amount of fish here, and you'll see in a moment just how many we see on an average day, all of this. So there's a lot of fish coming here. And because of that, there's also a lot of fish we find dead on the shore 
And so we wonder why there is such a high mortality rate. So our original study was the potential causes of gizzard shad mortality. We looked at four different possibilities, oxygen depletion beneath ice, disease or parasites in the fish, chemical contaminants from Erie Coke, and thermal shock. So for oxygen depletion, we looked at the ice coverage of the cove, which never happened. Because of the warm water discharge stream, it never freezes over. So oxygen depletion wasn't a plausible cause. For disease and parasites, we take fish that look like these ones, they're not too badly decomposed, that we take off the shoreline and perform necropsies on, and we never saw anything out of the ordinary as to the fish's health. For chemical contaminants, we did a literature review on other coke factories and their um, environmental impact. We thought that there could be a possibility of chemical contaminants, but for this specific die-off, we deemed that thermal shock was the most likely of the culprit. So our original hypothesis was that we believe the gizzard shad die off at Erie Coke's warm water discharge stream during the winter months of 2017 and 2018 were due to thermal shock. So here's some of our temperature data to support that hypothesis. So, oh yeah. So um, this picture is to give you a visual aid of how big the cove is that I'm talking about. So this blue line on the top here, um, yeah. That huge file is overloaded the system. No, it's not. <laughs> doesn't we'll just keep trying. Oh, <laughs> just, talk, just talk about it while it's like that and then start up on the next slide. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but anyway, so I'll just I'll, I'll okay. sit by the microphone. Anyways, so the cove that you see here, it's about 50 meters across. And so the picture I was showing you is at the top of this walkway right here. It is our considered our Lake Erie temperature. So that's the temperature that the lake should be if it doesn't have any interaction with warm water from the Erie Coast discharge. Over here, and so that temperature, on it was October 24th, 2018. At the tip of this jig walk, it was about 10.3 degrees Celsius. Over where the stream discharges right here, it was 20.4 degrees Celsius. And that 50 meter difference about here it's about 10 meters from where the discharge stream entered we considered that our mixing area where the water instead of having a thermal begins to mix together it was about 14.8 degrees celsius which is still a pretty de de uh, decent as well we the mouth of the stream discharged to see if there was a thermal line being created because of the warm water and such having such cold water and there was found on that particular, I can't remember the date, that particular day that at 0 0.6 meters, which is how deep the mouth of the stream is, the bottom of it, so it's about like from my foot to about here on my leg. And so the bottom of the stream was nine degrees Celsius and the top of the water that was the warm water going over the cold was 19 degrees Celsius. So over the span of a 0 0.6 meters, it increased 10 degrees Celsius. For a fish, that's nothing. They can swim up and down that like no tomorrow. So we thought that that could be a concern expediting the thermal shock process. And then, and then I had a graph showing the temperature, our overall temperature data collection. And so it showed that from 2017 to 2000. 18, a little bit of 2019 of our temperature data, that Erie Coke consistently remains warmer than Lake Erie. The closest they ever were were on January 20th, 2017, when Lake Erie and Erie Coke were only about two degrees Celsius difference. Other than that, Erie Coke consistently remains about 10 degrees Celsius warmer than our rest of Lake Erie sample. Do you want to try to I could keep talking. I had the whole thing memorized. <laughs> okay, let's try to start it from the next. Okay. Like it would be number ten. That's a video, but we can. 
skip over that. You want to try it? Yeah, we can try it. So the most drastic temperature change we saw was on February 18th, 2019, where it was 7 degrees Celsius outside and the water was spiking at 29 degrees Celsius or higher, but we deemed it at 29 degrees Celsius because it stayed kind of at that plateau. Um, as you can see, this is the video, but the picture of it is fine. It was snowing outside, we were freezing, but the water was steamy and it felt like you were standing in a hot tub. And so we began to wonder um, if the temperature is such a drastic increase, is this expediting the thermal shock process for the gizzard shad? So we suspected that thermal shock was the primary cause of death. Um, and our hypothesis was supported by Jay Gerber, an aquatic biologist with the DEP from the Northwest Regional Office's Clean Water Program, who came out and looked at our fish kills that we were investigating and agreed with us that the thermal shock was the culprit. Um, but the thing about thermal shock that makes it a concern is that it causes the fish to undergo a lot of stress. Um, as you can see here, there's a lot of things that happen. They release extra hormones, their immune system weakens, just like when we get stressed. And on top of that, you saw in the video, there's a lot of fish there and it's overcrowding. And so that overcrowding is also stressing the fish, fish weakening its immune system even more. So this was a video, but it's okay. Um, showing a gizzard shad just kind of swimming around, flopping a little bit, and it showed, it was the first sign that we had of that redness from the viral hemorrhagic septicemia. And we didn't think much of it. This was the same day that we had the really drastic temperature difference, so we thought it was just because it was such a drastic temperature change that the fish were just, maybe just getting a little red. And I don't know if it's gonna play, but that's okay. Um, but we went back a couple weeks later, we go every couple weeks, and we saw a huge die off. Typically we see 25 to 50 fish. On this day in particular, we saw, I'm actually just gonna my thing. Um, we saw 150 to 200 dead fish. And the entire cove that you saw that was our little pathway was just crammed with dead gizzard shad. And all the fish had this bleeding and this bloodiness like you saw in the first photo talking about VHS. And that's when we suspected that VHS was the culprit for this die off. And we sent our samples off to John Cole and we've begun looking into other VHS cases. We looked into the phenomenon of uh, behavioral fevers where sick or, or ailing fish move to warmer temperatures in I personally have not. And that's something very interesting because when the VHS outbreak occurred, for the first time we had different fish species besides gizzard shad coming into the water. So that's very interesting. I have not, but I will definitely look into that. It looks as though something like that's happening. Mm -hmm. Why would the fish move to the warmer water unless it was a reason to be there? Yeah. Um, good job rolling with the punches with the <laughs> tank problems, by the way. Um, are there environmental regulations on what temperature is allowable for a warm water discharge? There is, there are regulations on how much like how hot the water is but it's very vague because we looked into that to see if the water that the Erie Cove was discharging was not a part of that or within that regulatory standard and it doesn't really say specifically what a temperature is it just talks about how much they exit out and like where it can exit out of it doesn't say a temperature uh, is there any regulation on what temperature is allowable for a warm water discharge? Or? Sure, there is. It's actually a permanent discharge um, by DEP, but, uh, but I'm not exactly, okay. exactly sure. Yeah. Exactly. I think the, the maximum that we measured is close to what their mm -hmm. limit is. Yeah, like their maximum temperature is like, oh, it, was, right. it was really close. It's close to 30 degrees Celsius. Yeah. It's, not, it's not in the plant. It's a, there's a, a mixing of the, the lake that is yeah. all right. <coughs> In the very back. <laughs> uh, for the VHS uh, itself, is there uh, looking at the operation of that virus? Is there any parallel to the same thing that's happened to the blue green algae blooms is happening to the VHS? Is there a bloom of that virus? I have not seen a bloom there, to my knowledge, but that's also something I wasn't looking for. So if we look into it more, there's a possibility, but I have not personally looked into that. Do you want to try again? Jen, do you have a comment? Um, what other fish species did you, did you see any other fish species congregating around that warm water other than the shad? And if so, were they, were they also experiencing that thermal shock and dying off? 
Yeah, so for the first two years, 17 and 18, we saw the whole entire winter, we never saw another fish besides gizzard shad in the cove. This year when they had the VHS outbreak was the only time we've ever seen other fish species. We saw one drum or sheephead and one silver bass that was in my first pictures. But that's it. Other than that, it's always been just gizzard shad. So I'd like to follow up on two other questions then. So why do you think, what, why do you hypothesize that gizzard shad are aggregating at this time of discharge? I, I believe that it's because they are a warm water, so they are attracted to the warm water since they prefer it and it's where they typically do their breeding is in shallow warm water. So I think when they're in the lake and it's cold and they can sense that warm water that they migrate to it and they hang out there and that's why they're all there. So, so is, is it a good thing for the gizzard shad population or a bad thing for the gizzard shad population? It depends on how warm the discharge stream is. If it's warm enough that it's giving the fish a safe place that has a warmer temperature that's sustainable for them, then okay. <clears throat> but if it's spiking 30 degrees Celsius when the rest of the lake is 7 degrees Celsius and they're swimming into the lake and back into the cove and that's a 20 degrees Celsius difference, then that's not good. Thank you. Mark Lethaby from the Natural History Museum here at the Tom Ridge Environmental Center. If you've never seen the Natural History Museum, it's in our basement, but uh, Mark has some things displayed on our second floor exhibit area, and he will be talking about the short-headed garter snake's defense behavior. <coughs> okay, I'm going to try to get through this without the coughing jag. Uh, yeah, I apologize to previous pre presenters for uh, my coughing interruptions there. Um, so I don't really have uh, research per se to uh, present today, but I just have some uh, novel uh, observations on short-headed garter snakes that uh, maybe uh, could form the basis of student research if somebody wants to do some snake behavioral studies. Uh, <coughs> subject animal is the short-headed garter snake, the smallest of about 36 species of garter snakes in North America. Uh, typically about 10 to 15 inches in length, uh, up to about 23 inches. Uh, it's not only the smallest in size, but it has the smallest range of any species of a garter snake. Um, whereas the common garter snake ranges from the Pacific to the Atlantic and Canada, all the way through most of the United States. The uh, short-headed garter snake's range is limited to uh, northwestern Pennsylvania and the southern tier of western New York. So that's basically uh, the uh, northwestern unglaciated plateau physiographic section. And because its range is so restricted uh, and to uh, Pennsylvania, 95% of the range is in Pennsylvania, it's been designated a Pennsylvania responsibility species. Uh, but despite the fact that it's got a small range, it can actually be very common, even abundant. It can be the most common uh, snake in some areas uh, by a wide margin. Uh, so, and it also establishes <coughs> in urban areas where it's uh, introduced uh, outside of its uh, natural range. And uh, one more uh, relevant uh, aspect of its biology is that it's an earthworm specialist, so it's not known to eat any other prey item in nature. So um, because it's um, kind of the northwestern Pennsylvania specialty and because of uh, its limited range and relative remoteness of its uh, range, uh, it hasn't been well studied. So. Um, uh, plus, that's a neat little snake, so I decided to keep uh, detailed notes on any short-headed garter snakes that I found uh, in northwestern PA, uh, starting back a couple of decades ago. And uh, in 2011, um, Brian Gray and I decided to do a more in-depth study of a couple of short-headed garter snake uh, populations uh, actually within the city limits of Erie. Um, and since it was like a five or ten minute drive from my house, I could go out and and uh, survey them uh, very frequently. So we got a lot of data uh, on the snakes. And if you're interested uh, in that, uh, the details of that study, you can check out the Herpetological Bulletin. It's an open access uh, journal. You can just Google it and get download a PDF. So in the course of my uh, observations, I accumulated at least a thousand 
observations of individual uh, short-haired garter snakes. It's, like I say, this was not a formal study, it was just observations that I made in the field over time, for the most part there. And so that was like, that. I searched my field notes from between 2002 and 2014, and came up with roughly 1,000. Okay, so snakes have a repertoire of defensive behaviors, um, some of which can be cast, classified as bluff or threat displays. So a bluff is when an animal is unable to harm its antagonist. A threat is when it actually can inflict some kind of harm. And uh, common um, bluff displays in snakes include flattening of some part of the body, so that makes them look larger. Uh, gaping, so just an open mouth gape kind of uh, indicates an, a readiness to bite. And uh, striking is another uh, bluff behavior that some of the snakes will do. And I'm just going to talk about bluffs rather than threats since we're dealing with these small non-venomous snakes. Uh, some of the snakes will do striking motions um, without actually intending to bite. So I'm not talking about striking and biting, but just like making those motions. Uh, some of these snakes will actually try to, you know, they'll strike, but they'll keep their mouths completely closed, so they never actually even intend to bite. And of course, biting um, could be considered more of an attack than a bluff, but if you're talking about a small snake that's, whose bite really can't inflict any harm, uh, the bite could be considered a bluff, you know, where it's just still going to startle the predator into uh, releasing the animal or uh, backing away. So a small snake may not display a bluff behavior because it can't uh, provide a credible threat. So you know, basically, you don't want to waste your effort um, on a bluff if it's you know it's not going to be uh, you know it's not going to be a believable threat. The books will tell you that uh, short-headed garter snake anti-predator behavior basically consists of thrashing around. So they thrash around more than any other snake I'm aware of, you pick them up and they just thrash and squirm. Um, and they say, you know, they release musk and feces, which is a common uh, defensive behavior in snakes. And uh, some of the books will actually say they do not bite. Uh, so none of those bluff behaviors had ever been recorded in short-headed garter snakes until Brian Gray uh, recorded an instance in a Herpological Review on uh, a short-headed garter snake that he observed flattening, gaping, and striking. It, it's in the literature uh, under uh, Brian Gray's report, but other than that, uh, before or since, I've never seen any uh, uh, indication of uh, those behaviors in short heads. So since then, uh, I've observed instances of flattening behavior in short heads, gaping, uh, gaping and striking, and in two instances, I actually had uh, short head garter snakes um, bite me. So. So it's the first time, you know, like I said, anybody, mostly people that even work intensively with short heads, I mean, I never had one bite me or do any of those things. Uh, so I've gotten bitten twice by them. None the worse for wear. Uh, so in total, I had about uh, 12 instances of uh, bluff behaviors in short heads. And uh, so both in rural and uh, urban populations, among both sexes, gravid and non-gravid uh, females, uh, adults, and at least one uh, newborn short head over a temperature range of 17 to 29 degrees. And uh, flattening was the most common behavior, gaping next, and followed by striking, and then the two instances of biting. So we can establish that bluff behaviors do occur in Ramnophus barkistoma are rarely observed by human observers, and uh, these behaviors will uh, occur in uh, individuals of varying sex, age, uh, geographic location, and in uh, urban and rural habitats. So, if anybody wants to uh, take on like an experimental uh, project on the uh, shorthead uh, defensive behavior, uh, I think some interesting experiments can be set up to uh, see if they respond to different cues, find out what cues actually elicit that behavior. Um, I'm thinking like, like I said, a bluff behavior against a large mammal such as a human may not uh, seem like a, you know, that worth doing. Whereas maybe it might work against a short-tailed shrew, which are known to prey on uh, sh uh, short-headed garter snakes. And of course you could vary, uh, look at the variables that may uh, 
elicit the behavior like a variations in sex and uh, age and so forth. Um, in some other snakes, they found that uh, cooler temperatures will um, tend to, they'll, snakes at a cold, lower temperature will tend to exhibit those behaviors uh, because they're too cold to move away very fast, so they're, they're gonna strike and, and try to look in, intimidating because they can't crawl away, whereas at a higher temperature, they can just slither off. So that's, uh, that's all I got. And if, like I say, if anybody's got any uh, interest in snake behavior, I think you got the basis of a, a little study there. Any questions? Mike? Hey, uh, when you showed your list with the, the gender column, it looked like all the one were females. Is, yeah. Is it possibly? That's just uh, a bias in the number of uh, oh, okay. snakes I found. So, um, in our study, we had plywood cover boards, and uh, we tended to find uh, females under those, especially uh, before they uh, give birth. Okay. Was was that twelve out of or out of twelve hundred total encounters? Um, yeah, like I say, this is not. I wasn't keeping strict data. Uh, it was just kind of a byproduct. We really didn't expect to see those. Behaviors, but I recorded any kind of interesting uh, behaviors or aspects of the short heads I encountered. So, uh, roughly, you know, a thousand. Like I said, I didn't necessarily write down every single encounter that I had, but anytime I saw bluff behaviors, I wrote it down. So, 12 times in at least a thousand encounters. So, it's not a very common behavior. Other snakes, like garter, <coughs> common garter snakes, will do these things very frequently. Um, Brown snakes, they, they'll just, you know, a lot of times they'll just flatten out like, a, like they've been hit with a rolling pin. So. Yeah? Are the short-handed garter snakes any different in terms of their, <coughs> of their behavior? Are they more cryptic than the eastern garter snakes by any chance? Uh, um, I would say they're uh, less surface active than a common garter snake. You'll see common garter snakes out foraging quite frequently, um, but uh, they have a much wider uh, prey uh, preference, so they might be looking for frogs or uh, you know, fish or even small mammals sometimes, whereas uh, the shortheads are going to be looking for earthworms, so they're not necessarily out and about very often. It's tempting to think maybe if they, they're just not encountering other threatening Creatures yeah. as often if they're spending more of their time <coughs> under the leaves, you know, maybe maybe they don't need to have it. Yeah, that's another aspect of it—the yeah. fossorial yeah. nature of some of those right. snakes. Uh, the uh, mountain, the, the earth snake, is another one that's very fossorial and doesn't come to the surface very often. Also, a small, harmless snake, and uh, it's those behaviors are not uh, very commonly seen in those. But I saw a couple of notes where. I saw a, a, a mountain earth snake that uh, did some uh, striking and, and biting. So, you know, they're kind of similarly infrequent. Yeah. Anybody wants to see our museum during the break? Just talk to me. Let me know. Great. Yeah, if you haven't seen it, it's worth the tour. Um, so we have a 20 minute break, we'll come back here about 10.30, and we're moving on from amphibians, reptiles, and fish to bats and birds. So we'll see you back here in about 20 minutes.
That'd be great. Thank you. I'm Steve Robeski. I'm a biology professor at Gannon, so thank you for coming. We have three great talks, one on birds, which is okay, and then two on bats, which is exciting. <laughs> but they both eat insects, so we're in great shape here, aren't we? Our first presenter is uh, Joel Seacrest, and Joe is going to talk about how do you misplace half a million birds. So this ought to be interesting to find out where they are. Thank you, Joe. Thank you. All right, thanks for everybody for coming out. Uh, hopefully my voice holds up. I too am fighting a cold and hopefully I didn't cough too much through the uh, other presentations today. Um, I'm Joe, hi. Uh, I work for Purple Martin Conservation Association and uh, I'm gonna talk about some of our ongoing work and some of the adventures that uh, go along with that. And I too, as well as Mark, ha would love to have students uh, work with us and uh, do grad you know, grad projects or undergrad projects uh, to great species for uh, that sort of thing. So, uh, purple martins, uh, not that purple. They're actually blue. They're uh, uh, males, uh, adult males on the left. I got a purple laser pointer. To, um, females and subadults uh, have a more drab color like that. Um, I'm just going to kind of go through the basics pretty quick here because I got a lot to say. Uh, they eat about a quarter of a trillion insects each year, so they're a pretty uh, useful part of our ecosystem. Um, but as other aerial insectivores like themselves, and really birds as a whole, uh, populations are strongly declining. Um, since 1966, when the Breeding Bird Survey started, populations have dropped about 0.87% uh, each year, which is equivalent of a loss of about a third of all martins in that time. Um, and it's kind of a complex uh, system we're trying to figure out why that's happening. This is a breeding bird survey map. Red is bad, where uh, populations yearly in the last 50 years are declining more than 1.5%. You can see it's not like kind of a latitudinal trend. It's all over the place. There's places that are doing great with a 1.5% gain annually right next to places that are doing terrible. So, you know, we're trying to figure out about all of the factors at play. Um, past speech is done and, and that's sort of uh, pretty helpful. What's going on here in North America where they breed and we've got a pretty good handle on the ecology here. Uh, but they are a migratory species that's overwinters down in the Amazon rainforest of Brazil. Um, and we lack a thorough understanding of what is all affecting them, what's going on in their lives while they're down there. Um, so, my organization, being Purple Martin Conservation, we're trying to figure out what we can do to conserve them. Uh, you know, one of our main tools in the uh, toolbox is uh, bird banding, and we have an extensive bird banding program. I get, actually need to update that number. It's probably closer to 25,000 uh, Purple Martins that we banded over the years, but you're going to get limited uh, information when it comes to migration to remote areas and you don't get a lot of info on what's going on down south from bird banding. So about 10 years ago, uh, these little magical devices called a light level geolocator, uh, which is a data logger that you put on uh, the birds like a little backpack. It's got a light sensor on it that detects uh, when sun rises and sun sets the length of day and from that you can figure out where north, south, east, west you are in the world. Um, and Purple Martins right here at Presque Isle were the first songbird species to actually wear uh, one of these uh, types of uh, data loggers which have now become uh, you know, quite popular in research. Uh, so that happened right here very first with our work, uh, the PMCA's work with York University up in Canada. Uh, but we have an extensive network with our partners uh, uh, of places where we're doing this type of research. So uh, our kind of our major partners, University of Manitoba has kind of taken up the reins from York University. Uh, and Disney's Animal Kingdom is also a major uh, 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 researcher with us, a partner. Um, but we put on tags all over, uh, you know, North America. Um, and from those early light level geolocator tags, which only have a resolution of about 200 kilometers, you know, you, you can't pinpoint it from this data, but you can get a lot. You can get a, a lot of information on speed and rough routes of travel, 
times at different stopover locations. And you could tell stories like this bird uh, was up in Alberta. Uh, it's migration south. I kind of skipped those slides, but it was about a month and a half, kind of a leisurely migration south, um, down with a, about a month layover in the Yucatan, hanging out by Cancun in the uh, in Mexico on the way down. But on the way back, it, it cruised. It went in three weeks and made that entire migration. Uh, so about uh, you know 10,000 kilometers in three weeks, which is equivalent of about 600 kilometers a day. So they really cruise on the way back. So we got, you know, started to get a picture of what's going on with migration. We were able to take a look. These are tracks of all the geolocator tags that we put out here in Erie, and you can see places, you know, they the, the kind of funnel together so we get an idea of the different types of habitat that these birds are using uh, so we can conserve that, you know, those parts that seem to be of great importance to them. Um, along came GPS tags. About five years ago, we started putting those out on Purple Martins, and those take the resolution from 200 kilometers down to two meters. So you can go from saying a bird is in this part of a state to birds in this tree. And our first results from that uh, were amazing. We could not believe what we saw. Uh, so we've got birds from pretty much all over the range, Texas, Florida, Pennsylvania, Ontario, and Minnesota, all coming together. This is the overwintering range down here, uh, all that purple, but all those birds spent time at the exact same little sandbar in a tributary of the Amazon River, which is insane because we have this limited sample size of birds from all over the range. The fact that they all coincidentally came together on these little points you know, we had other overlaps as well. We were blown away. So we had to get down there and see what the heck is going on. So we uh, managed to scratch up some grant funding, headed down the Amazon River to these islands to see what it's like on the ground. Because you can only tell so much from Google Earth uh, zooming in, you know, until the pixels get uh, the size of the screen. So that's us cruising up on our Amazon River boat. And here's us on one of those islands. Uh, so this is an island on the Rio Negro, which is one of the two main rivers that makes up the Amazon. So it's upstream from the Amazon, actually farther into the jungle. Uh, it's this white sand islands, as you could see, you could see that from the satellite views, but very sparse uh, vegetation and only really leafed out on the very tops of the trees. Here's a look down that, that island that we happen to stop at with our river and river boat in the background. Here's a look at that from Google Earth. Um, and what we didn't realize, you know, it really didn't resonate with us until we were there, that the Amazon River and its tributaries has a huge swing in depth levels between rainy season and dry season, up to 40 to 50 feet in, in water difference. And that, you know, it, it's not a, you know, it's not in a valley, so that the river also expands outward quite a bit as that water level goes up. So that picture's in the dry season, which happened to be when we were there. Here's a picture in the wet season. Just those tippy tops of the uh, trees, uh, the vegetation sticking out there. Um, so, you know, we started to see why the birds might be using this habitat. It's isolated from ground predators. You know, it's a safe place for them to roost when they're, uh, you know, coming in uh, at night to, to stop feeding. But we had uh, another plan for when we were there, and that was, uh, let's see if I can get this going. Uh, this, will, this will show you. Purple mountains. Stay still, and they will settle within inches of you. Why they come here? such numbers is a mystery. It can hardly be that they seek warmth in this murky tropical atmosphere of central Brazil. They don't feed here. Perhaps it's because there are fewer hawks around to harry them than in the forest. But whatever the reason, come they do. So that's David Attenborough's famous voice there. That's the 
excerpt from Life of Birds. Um, and he is at a petroleum refinery that's right on the banks of the Amazon River that has this very famous and well-known purple martin roost at it. So we were going to use that roost as kind of a base of research for down there uh, when we were uh, down in Brazil in 2016. Unfortunately, uh, we finally broke radio silence with the refinery guys and they said, ah, Purple Martins, they're not here anymore. They didn't tell us what happened. Um, we didn't know if maybe they just didn't want uh, environmental types sniffing around a petroleum refinery. Uh, maybe they did something nefarious they didn't want to talk about to get rid of them. Maybe the birds just happened to move on their own. We didn't know. We were kind of suspicious that they were giving us a line. So we decided we needed to do a stakeout. So this is us uh, talking to a, a boat captain on the river. And uh, you know we convinced him he thought we were crazy, but we you know, hired him to take us down the river uh, and set up shop across the river from this refinery in, uh, as the sun came down and we were gonna look for uh, birds coming in to see if they really were gone or if they were still there and the guys just didn't want to sniff it around. Uh, we got there and it's pouring rain just like it does uh, during uh, you know, the evening and pretty much all the time in the Amazon. Um, and uh, so we lowered the sides down to the boat so we're sitting across from uh, this refinery in the river with binoculars peering out and for the eagle eyed among you, you might have noticed at the beginning of that video uh, there were military boats. There happens to be a military base right next to this refinery. So I'm there freaking out because surely we're going to go to jail. How suspicious does this look? This boat, you know, precariously parked on a little sandbar across the river from this petroleum refinery with, you know, strange, you know, visitors peeking out. Um, but we waited. The, the skies cleared and no birds came. So they really were gone. So we were without a base of operations down there. So we came back with our tail between our legs a little bit uh, and decided to get to work figuring out where the Purple Martins are in Brazil. It wasn't gonna be as easy as we thought. Uh, we formed an international Purple Martin working group with uh, several universities here in North America, a couple of Brazilian uh, research organizations uh, and Disney Animal Science and Environment. We've got regular uh, video conferences that look like the beginning of the Brady Bunch. Um, we started a citizen science project down there, <coughs> Projeto Andorinha Azul, which is you know trying to use the power of the people down there. Uh, Purple Martins, Andorinhas, are uh, you know held in high regard down in Brazil. Um, it's kind of a cultural thing. Uh, so we were able to gather from several different sources reports from, of where Purple Martins are down in Brazil historically and uh, during the current season. Unfortunately, they're not big on eBird down there because that would make things a lot easier for us. So we kind of had to make our own, you know, eBird of our own. And we continued to collect GPS uh, tag data. Uh, you, not, you can't see that, but it's just zigzags all over the place. Uh, it's, it's an overlay of several different GPS tracks. Um, and we started to put that information together. We started to get some clues. Uh, unfortunately, with those GPS tags, the clues are from last year. It's an archival tag. You've got to recapture the birds you know, when they come back. It doesn't automatically upload the data. That type of technology is too heavy for the birds to carry. But uh, you can kind of see that. This is Manaus right here. Uh, and we had a little island where there were two birds in 2017 uh, that were uh, spending the night over and over on that island. And it's another one of those with just the treetops showing. The, the little spokes radiating out are feeding trips during the day, coming back at night. So it was doing a fix in the day and night, back and forth, back and forth they go. This is uh, what that island looks like in the dry season. Looks very familiar to our previous one. That's it in the wet season. So another one with just the treetops. So we started, we, we, had, we had a lead. Uh, we went back down to Brazil in the end of 2018. Yes, 2018. Um, and we traveled southern Brazil, following up on leads all over the country. 
Uh, this is us wandering down a r road in rural southern Brazil where agriculture is very heavy uh, to try and identify some uh, swallows that are flying around. We were in the rainforest, we were in uh, city squares, which traditionally is kind of where you would hear that purple martin overnight roosts were in, uh, in Brazil. We were above the rainforest, uh, but we weren't just searching for uh, these roosts. We were also going to expand our research when we did find a roost, because we knew we would eventually. Uh, the MODIS wildlife tracking system uses tiny tracking devices and a network of hundreds of receiving stations strategically located throughout the Western Hemisphere. MODIS is yielding spectacular discoveries. Now, researchers can safely track bird movements over vast distances and with incredible detail to pinpoint the greatest threats to vulnerable species. So, there's actually MODIS Tower on top of the observation tower here. This is the international collaboration. Uh, basically, it's TV antennas. It's a cell phone network for animals. As they fly by or swim by or walk by or whatever, it just pings on the tower. And we were going to use that system to learn more on the wintering grounds about what purple martins are doing. Because, uh, you know, we have limited scope in what we can study here in migratory purple martins. We know the ones that leave from here, but down there there's birds from all over the place and we don't really know much about uh, the specifics of their behavior. So this is going to be a low cost way to actually study them down there. And uh, actually this, this is us uh, on an observation tower over the Amazon, over Virgin Amazon Rainforest Towers. Um, that's it on the there. These, I'm so proud of these. These are my babies. I've got two kids and I've got pictures of this on my desk. Uh, I also have pictures of my kids, but these, I'm so proud of these little TV antennas. Um, and the one on the right there is actually overlooking the river where that island is that we thought maybe that's where they moved to. Um, this is just a map of all of the stations all over uh, uh, the world that are, take part in this network. And you can see our little yellow dots right there in the middle of the Amazon rainforest all alone. But, you know, just a great start to what you can do with this research in Brazil. And we waited. We came back. We had. We, we went to that island. The birds weren't there. I came back. And we knew it was going to happen eventually, uh, but it was just a matter of time. We started to see some birds right before we left, but nothing major. So came back. A couple months pass. Start to get messages in the group chat. Holy bleep! We've seen it. It's much more spectacular than we imagined. I have no words. So I dropped everything was down there as quick as I could be and uh, we headed out um, on the river this is high water season so we're going through flooded Amazon rainforest remember I said it really expands out widely as the water goes up it's exactly what you picture deepest darkest Amazon black water trees you know it's totally uh, a scene out of a movie or a book and uh, you're probably not going to be able to see this on the projector, but we found the roost. Uh, approximately half a million martins was our estimate, 300 to 500,000. Um, amazing, uh, just spectacle to witness, especially they all just shoot down after they, they're milling around in the air and they all all at once and it's audible. You feel the wind rush from it when they all decide that they're going to go down. It's incredible. Um, but we finally had our base of research operations. This is a picture that kind of gives it a little more justice, but it doesn't capture that there's levels. You know, as your eye adjusts to farther and farther up into the air and higher altitude, it's equally as dense. Birds galore. And uh, we captured several. We started putting out these MODIS tags, and this is research that's ongoing. So. This just happened this year. We're still gathering the data. We're going to be going down next year to uh, continue to put tags out. That right there is the first purple martin uh, captured in Brazil with with a tag put on it. Um, you know, so 
basically how we how we captured these birds we waited until dark waited until they settled in took a boat paddled up quietly and just picked them off the branches um, so we would just come back with bags full of purple martins um, and uh, where where is that roost well this is the island that we thought they might be on and there at this one it seems like maybe they moved uh, so you can see the, there's some blue lines there actually it was in February of this year when I went down there and we tagged those birds the GPS tags that then we retrieved this breeding season one of the birds was actually there from our site I missed it by a couple of weeks according to the timing of the tag but you know our paths crossed uh, and this is an animation of the tags that we ret retrieved this year the GPS tags the blue one on there is the one that uh, that uh, ended up at that roost that we located so it was a combination of uh, citizen science work it was a combination of uh, the GPS ongoing research that we were able to locate these this massive roost of purple martins and uh, you know establish a, a base of uh, field operations down there so that's all I got I don't have any real meat on the details this the uh, statistics of it yet but uh, kind of a fun story uh, about the adventures that we get to go on sometimes and I would love to hear from uh, any students or any professors that want to work with us in the future. Uh, it's an easy study species. They, they have site fidelity. They come back every year to the same place, which makes that GPS tagging a lot easier. And uh, you know, they're, they're very used to human activity, which is part of their ecology. So that's all I got. We have time for one quick question that you got to grab. Joe at lunch. Yeah. Uh, when these purple martins are coming to roost in the trees, do they choose a particular species of tree at a particular height and when they're roosting or they're down low? You said you picked them off the limbs, I'm assuming they might have Yeah, so I, I didn't have time to go into it, but um, th that particular island is kind of a monoc monoculture. It doesn't have a common name, it's just a species name, just like everything else down there. Um, but it's not specific, you know, on individual roosts. It doesn't seem like, just like here, it seems like it's more of the physical location and the characteristics on the ground than the species of tree. Um, what looked like bushes that we were picking them off of there for that roost, that was actually the tippy tops of, you know, 40, 50 foot rainforest trees that we were floating above in a boat. So it was kind of surreal to. <coughs> You know, you look and you think it's just your normal uh, wetland vegetation, but it was actually treetops. So, thank you, Joe. All right. Next, we have a couple of my students who are going to give you the update on our now 16-year project of marking and tagging bats on the campus of Gannon University. And so Ali and Jocelyn are going to take over once we once we get our present. How do they get to it, Eric? Eric's going to help us get to it. Thanks, Eric. Does everyone give an Eric a round of applause for doing all this stuff? Hello, everybody. I'm Alessandra. I'm Jocelyn. And we're going to talk to you about the census of bat community um, around our campus at Gannon and in Erie in general. So first, I'm going to give you everything you need to know about bats, what's affecting them, and why we care. So first, I'm going to talk to you about bats. It's, they're important because they're the only mammals that are capable of true flight. They make up about one quarter of mammal species with 1,100 species of their own. <laughs> They live almost everywhere in the world, except for in extreme deserts and polar regions, and this is due to the extreme hot and cold and the lack of um, insects and things for them to use for their supplies. They feed at night and they sleep during the day, so they're nocturnal, and even though they do important things for us, like pollinate flowers, disperse seeds, and eat millions of insects, they have been scientifically neglected until recently. So why we care is because the bat numbers have been decreasing due to white nose syndrome, which I'll explain next. So white nose is by a psychrophilic, that means loving fungus, called Pseudogymnoscus disruptans. 
Because it's cold loving, it survives really well in the caves, which also is where the bats live. They provide a damp, cool environment for optimal fungus growth, and over half of the U.S. bat species hibernate in caves, which makes them a perfect pair. The fungus usually manifests on the wings, tail, and nose of the bats, and the, the spores are viable for extended periods of time. So on the next slide, you can see um, the whiteness syndrome on the nose and then on the membrane of the wings. This is really bad for the bats because it puts holes in the membranes and it makes it hard for them to fly. So when they're waking up in the winter, they're not able to fly really well, which means they're using their fat reserves. So white nose syndrome is extra bad because it wakes the bats up because it's itchy and scratchy. So it's kind of, um, Dr. Robesky compares it to athlete's foot. So if you wake up, it's itchy, scratchy, it bothers them. So they're waking up in the middle of winter when they're supposed to be hibernating and they're looking for food, fat, and they're wasting their fat reserves and it suppresses their immune systems. So as they wake up, they look for insects and they can't find any and they die by the end of the winter. So the mortality rate has approached almost 100% in some caves and since its discovery, it has already killed over 6 million bats. It also has been said to be the most precipitous wildlife decline in the past century of North America. Here is a map. This is the 2019 spread of white nose syndrome. And you can see here it's over in California and it's up in Washington. In the 2018 map, we saw none in California at all and only one small dot. So we are thinking that someone around these areas of migration, since the spores are long living, they took it with them on their hiking clothes and their boots over into the West Coast and had it spread down, it's gonna spread down. The, the biggest fear is that it'll spread down the West Coast and into Mexico, and that is where the, you can see the bats are migrating down. So the fear is it'll spread all the way down to where they migrate. So like I said, our concern is extinction. Um, nine species have been affected by white nose and three are already federally endangered. The strategy is to manage and conserve the bats that have been affected and to keep it out of new different caves. And um, this is really bad for several reasons. It's environmental, agricultural, and financial impacts. This is due from the environment with the chemical pesticides that are needed because the bats aren't eating insects that they were before. Also bad for agricultural because of the increase in chemical pesticides and financial because the farmers and ranchers are having to buy more pesticides to put on their crop because the bats aren't eating the insects like they were before. So the treatment is being bounced around between a couple different ideas. Georgia State is, has been developing an antifungal treatment. It's called Rhodococcus rhodochorus, and it has been shown to reduce the mold growth on ripening fruit. So in 2015, they individually took 75 bats and put the Rhodococcus rhodochorus on them and released them back into the wild for the winter, and they all survive. So their research is continuing in the Black Diamond Tunnel. This was a little bit difficult because they had to individually take the bats and put it on each one. So the next study is looking at the, um, with Western Michigan and Ball State, they're using a different antifungal agent and they're taking this and trying to make it into um, a nebulizer. So you can think of it like a aerosol can, like a hairspray. That way they can spray it on the bats in the environment to make it easier to get across into the caves and onto the bats. So why downtown Erie PA? The main reason is because up in Canada, we are the smallest distance from Canada to America, which is where the bats migrate from all the way down to the south. So we do on our campus at Gannon, we do bat walks around our campus every single day to look for bats and try to find where they're roosting and where they like to stay. So when we do find a bat on campus, we mark them. They're marked by location and the number and the group species. So we mark them with a dot scheme washable paint, which you'll see on the next slide, and it's done to see where the bats come to every night. So if we mark them and then they come back the next night, we know if they like that spot or not. We do not handle them because of the disturbance, the rabies and the white nose syndrome, so it's just the dot scheme. On the next slide, you can see where we mark them, and that's how we tell when they come back if they're the same bat that we saw before. So. Our whole research hypothesis is that the number of bats in Erie will decrease from the previous census due to the presence of white nose syndrome over time. And next, Jocelyn will explain to you the decrease that we've seen so far with the bats. Okay, so we're gonna start by talking about some of the data that we've seen over the years that we've done this research. Um, starting in 2006, we actually were able to see about 1,200 bats every single year. 
up until 2012, which is this first data point here. So um, this is demonstrating the number of bats that we were able to mark versus the number of bats that we were able to not mark in 2012, but the bats that were seen. So we were about able to mark around 30% of the bats this year. And then the following year in 2013, there was the first major drop off in bat population in, a, in our campus. Um, we only saw 135 bats, so that's a significant decrease. Um, again, we were able to mark about 30% of the bats. However, the following year, there was yet again another huge drop off in the population, seeing only seven bats. So once again, we were able to mark about 30%, but obviously a large decrease in the bat population. 2015, there was a slight increase again, but in 2016, we were again back down to five bats. In 2017, we saw 13. In 2018, we saw six bats. And then this year in 2019, so far we've seen a total of six bats. Um, we were able to mark 50% of them this year though. So the distribution of species is demonstrated in these next um, data points here. Um, in 2012, you can see that the majority of the bats were little brown bats, also a significant number of big brown, um, which would be like the next largest amount of bat species that we saw. Uh, in 2013, again, mostly little brown bats. And in 2014, we only saw big browns and little, ba little browns, again, mostly little browns. In 2015, mostly big browns, but um, still just big browns and little browns once again. In 2016, again, the same trend as 2015, mostly big browns, but still mostly big browns and little browns. In 2017, mostly big browns once again, as well as little browns and one red bat. Um, this is just demonstrating the bat species, how the different species were affected by white nose syndrome by their numbers decreasing so much. Uh, in 2018 here, you can see again, little brown had the most, big brown again, and then there was an eastern pit mistral as well. And then this year in 2019, we've seen uh, five little brown bats and one big brown bat so far. So this is the distribution of the number of bats seen per day since we start the research in about March and end it in about October every year. Um, there's two significant points here that we want to point out, this peak here and this peak here. This first peak is generally in August and this is when the bats are actually giving birth to their young and teaching them how to fly and um, catch insects and eat. So they're obviously coming out of their caves a lot more in this area, which is why we see a lot more bats at that time. And then the second peak here is when it starts to get a little bit colder. Um, insects aren't as common, especially in like September. So the bats are coming out of their caves because they're going to start their migration south to follow the insects. And then in 2013, again, the same two ideas of these peaks, but just way less numbers of bats. Here's the distribution from 2014, 2015, 2016, again, the distribution is just different because not as many bats were seen. 2017, a little bit more seen in August and September. 2018, again, more in August. And then in 2019, so this year we've seen the majority in August and October seeing three, so half we're seeing now. So, um, Also what we've noticed and what we have been trying to mark were where the bats were found on our campus. Some of the more important buildings for our research that we have noticed more bats on were the East Communication Arts Building, the East Palumbo Academic Center, and our Old Main Building. And we're about to take a look at these buildings to see why they're better roost sites for the bats. So the East Communication Arts Building, as you can see, it's very recessed back here in this area. So the bats are able to tuck up away in here, away from direct sunlight and direct wind, and um, away from direct person interaction. People don't really disturb them there. In <coughs> previous years, we have seen a lot more bats in this site. Um, and this year, we've actually seen two here. So it's definitely been a good site for us to find bats. Um, also, at the Palumbo Academic Center, this area is really high. So the bats are able to go all the way up here and really stay away from people and disturbances, as well as, again, staying out of that direct sunlight and out of the direct wind. Um, We've seen one bat here this year, but in previous years, even prior to 2013, we've seen a lot of bats in this area. East Old Main on the front area here has been another great place to find bats. 
Mainly, one good reason is because of these, this brick pattern, which is much more cave-like for the bats to cling on for their roosts. And um, as well as these grates here, which are actually in these windows, which are right behind these plants. Um, these grates allow for the bats to go in to where people can't follow them, so they can tuck away. It's a very cave-like setting. They're really comfortable in there. Uh, as you can see, there's a bat here and here in this image. So there's two bats tucked away behind these grates. It's a really good place for us to look and find bats on our campus. This year we found two bats up here. In previous years, in 2013, we found 45. So definitely a very cave-like natural environment for them to be in, as well as it being recessed again with no direct wind or sunlight. One of our better places has actually been East Old Main, which is this what we call the cave area. This door down here actually isn't really used. It's an emergency exit, so there's no person interaction at all with the bats. Um, the roof area down here is great like um, so it's really similar to the ceilings that bats cling on in bat houses <coughs> so they can tuck up in these little grates and roost up in there very easily as well as it being out of direct sunlight and wind again and there's usually standing water right in this area so there's direct insect populations from that standing water where they can get food for every night so they just tend to come right back in here. This year we haven't seen any here but over previous years it has been a really good site to see bats. So our conclusions have obviously been that bat numbers have been declining especially in Erie and on the Gannon University campus. You can see here in 2010 to 2012 we had 1,200 bats even in years previous we had 1,200 bats from 2006 to 2012. And then in 2013 was the first big drop, and then from there it just continued to significantly decrease. Um, so our concern is that more species are going to become endangered, and because of this being endangered, we're not going to be able to mark the bats anymore with the paint even. So we're not going to be able to keep track of if the bats are coming back to the same sites or not, which is going to significantly affect our research. So our future plans are going to continue doing this research. We're continuing to do it right now. We're probably getting to the period where we're gonna stop looking for bats because it's getting cold and we won't see any more. And then we'll start back up again next year in 2020. Um, we also just really wanna communi communicate this research with our campus and make a really bat-friendly environment around our Gannon University campus. We wanna share our findings and our knowledge of white-nose syndrome, but also just share the fact that bats aren't dangerous and we really wanna preserve them. And so if students or other professors see bats in buildings or like around the campus, they know to go to Dr. Robski to let him handle them or you know, get them out of their houses even if he needs to. And then also maintenance is doing really well with learning about bats and really picking up on the techniques to remove bats from places if they need to. So basically just making sure that no one's killing bats and we're keeping them safe and relocating them if need be. And also um, pictured here is we wanna put in alternate roost sites for the bats, which would be bat houses around campus. Our idea is to put them in areas that are obviously more populated with bats that we have t generally found more bats over the years. So here's our acknowledgments and some of the sources that we used. Does anyone have any questions? Mm -hmm. <laughs> we have time for questions while you're waiting. So depressing, what's going on with bats. Um, is there any light at the end of the tunnel anywhere in the range where this white nose is affecting birds? Or not birds, sorry. The yeah, other flying is thinking. Um, is there any natural immunity, anything like that that's you know, kind of evolving, spreading in, into the populations, or is it just doing a blind shot? I think right now the hope is with the like the aerosol type spray just to contain it as much as possible. But I, I don't not that I know of that there's anything. So the guys that work in with the game commission have found that maybe like one percent of the bats in a cave might have natural immunity to it. But the concern is that this, since that's a small number, is a gene pool gonna be enough to bring a whole species back again? So it's still up in the air. I know. From twelve hundred down to seven, five or six bats. What time of year does most of the white nose syndrome mortality occur? <clears throat> okay, um, so <clears throat> since it affects the bats while they're hibernating in the caves, um, yeah, in the winter, you're right. Yeah, 
So um, in the winter when the bats are hibernating and they're flying in the winter because they're using their bat reserves, that's when oh. it's really spreading among the bat populations and it's affecting them because when they're flying and they're using their reserves, they're, good, they're not going to make it through the winter because they don't have that fat layer anymore during their hibernation. Are they carriers of it, or is it resident in the caves? Do they spread it to each other, or do they just pick it up from the environment? Well, the spores live for a long time, so it's possible to get it from, like on that map that I showed, it was probably not probable that the bat migrated all the way to California. It was more likely that someone took the spores with them there. So they can spread it to each other, the caves can host it, or people can bring it with them when they go hiking or something like that. Um, people keeping records of the caves, of the bats in the caves in the West. And are you aware of those records? And are their numbers showing the same as your numbers were showing, like 1,200, 1,100, 1,200? Do you have those records? We haven't really focused on the um, populations there in the caves, just because we've been focused on Gannon and Erie in general. Um, we don't actually know uh, about that. We just know that it's spread over there, and that's possibly going to be devastating for the bat populations. So. One more question. Yep. How do you find the roosting sites on campus? Are they known roosting sites, or do you have certain parameters you walk around campus and look for new roosting sites? We have a path that we try to follow every day to make sure we're keeping consistent, but those three that we shared with you are the most common that we found over the years. So we try to keep the same path, that way we can make sure that we're keeping it consistent with the bats. But it's, I mean, it's about a 30 minute walk, so we cover a good amount of distance every day. And every once in a while, someone will say, hey, I saw a bat in the building where we've never seen one before, so we go and check it out. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> nice job, ladies. All right, on to our last talk. And this is Kelly Pierce from Allegheny, who's going to talk to us about the bat community on Prescott State Park. Perfect segue, isn't it? <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs> Mike is reminiscing about the old days of slide projectors and overhead projectors and carousels. And the ball blows, you have extra balls right there ready to go. And then we had to go to the conferences both ways uphill in a snowstorm, right? Didn't we? Questions for my students while we're waiting. There was one. There was oh, a yeah, I had a question. We didn't get to. Um, oh, it's ready now. Yeah. So uh, about the paint. Oh, sorry. Um, does the paint stay on year to year, or just throughout your throughout your season? Days, like oh, just a few days. Yeah. Mm -hmm. okay. So it has to be non-toxic and washable right. because of the game commissions. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Protocols. Yeah. Mm -hmm. We can't handle the bats anymore because if we handle them, we just 
disturb them, they get upset, they fly around during the day, they waste energy, and we might be mm -hmm. you know, encouraging their death because yeah, they're wasting the energy and they're flying around. So right. all we can do is this little dot of paint, which is good for maybe a couple days if mm -hmm. it doesn't rain. Mm -hmm. As uh, white nose has reached the Bracken Cave and those huge not that I know of yet. down in the Yeah, in Texas, not, I don't think that's the case in Bracken or Carlswell. Certainly not Carlsbad because it's not that far south uh, yet. And I don't think it's a matter, I don't think it's in the, Mammoth Cave in Kentucky yet. I don't know for sure. I know that when you go into Mammoth Cave now, you have to walk across basically a conveyor belt, walking, uh, you know, those moving sidewalks like an airport, and you got to walk through about an inch and a half of bleach to make sure you don't have any spores on your feet anyway. At least. Is that from my flash drive that you're talking about? I don't think so. That's from the one we took there. Okay. You know it is. We were just talking. We got to talk with Joe about these GPS. Uh, yeah. Trying to yeah. get a couple of them on our backs and see where they're going. My guess is caves somewhere in Pennsylvania. That'd be my guess. But I'm not. I don't know. Maybe they're going all the way south to Florida or someplace else. I don't think we really know. So I think that's a. When you were like, wow. Do they? Do they have site fidelity? Would it be uh, returning? Sure. Usually yes. Yeah. Usually they are good. I'm going back in the same cave for the winter, but I don't. We don't know where our bats are going. So I think that's an, how much do these cost? Uh, it varies. Okay. Uh, a couple hundred dollars. Oh, that's not bad. Well, you only have six bats. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. yeah, you can get the Cadillac. staying for the final talk of the uh, symposium. Uh, luckily mine's just a speed talk and so I don't there's not a lot of time between now and lunch and uh, the presenters before me gave a really nice background of bats and so I'm not, not going to get into that too much. Um, so today I'm going to talk about a proposed project um, that will hopefully occur in starting June of this year looking at summer bat community at Presque Isle State Park. And so, in terms of studies done on Presque Isle State Park, there's not um, too many that I've found. Uh, Anderson in 2008, uh, in, uh, prior to uh, putting in a wind turbine on the property, used an acoustic detector to uh, analyze the presence of a variety of bat species that were, was in the area. Uh, and then, of course, Dr. studies that Gannon University is a good idea in terms of region, what's going on with the bat population. And then on the north side of Lake Erie, on the Long Point in Ontario, uh, McGuire et al., they use that MODIS system to tagging uh, bats there. And so there, there is some information on the north side of Lake Erie um, as well about uh, kind of um, mostly migratory bats. They mostly are looking at silver-haired bats there that are migrating south uh, during the winter. And so my proposed study site uh, for this year it includes three sites. Um, these sites are also tied in with the wetland restoration sites. And so these are sites that have been the focus of invasive species management, including um, um, the removal um, of, of invasive species in the area. And so we have uh, three sites that are uh, identified as potential for uh, this study including the neck here of, of the Presque Isle, uh, Leo's Landing, which is what's pictured over here, and then the old gas well trail uh, just south there of the marina area. And so in terms of the methods that I've proposed, uh, this will be a um, capture uh, method. And so we will be using um, triple high mist nets. These basically are mist nets that are nine meters long, three meters tall, stacked in sets of three. 
And so you can see here, they're very similar to mist nets for birds, except they're a little thinner, um, a little bit more fragile. And basically a bat flies into them, it falls down into the shelf. And you, you can hear this when bats fly into these nets. And so you go, you, you bring down the nets, it's a pulley system. Um, you bring down the nets, you retrieve the bat. Um, and there you can start collecting data. Some of the data that we intend to collect include the species, uh, the sex, uh, whether it's a juvenile or an adult. Uh, we also do a wing score, and so we um, look at their wing uh, for scarring, which is evidence of PD or white nose syndrome, them waking up and scratching themselves. So we give them a wing score from um, zero to seven. We uh, collect information such as the right forearm length, the reproductive condition. Also, uh, white nose, uh, the fungus shows up under ultraviolet light, and so shining an ultraviolet light on the bat will indicate if there's any fungus uh, that you can see visually. And so those are the types of information that I'm proposing to collect on these bat species. So some of the potential detections that I could expect um, include these species that are primarily our cave dwelling species in Pennsylvania, so the little brown bat, the big brown bat, and the northern long-eared bat. Um, I was part of a study recently where we uh, were tracking these big brown, these uh, northern long-eared bats, or you can see the antenna kind of coming out of the back. We glued a little um, GPS tracker on the back of these bats and followed them to their day roost sites. Um, so these are our primary cave dwelling bats here in Pennsylvania. Uh, we have our red bats and our tricolored, also known as our eastern pipistrelle, um, now more commonly referred to as a tricolored bat. These are our primarily tree roosting bats, so these guys, um, rather than spending the time in the cave, they spend time um, on uh, elms, things like uh, trees like shagbark hickory where the bark's coming out and they can kind of roost up into the air. Um, so these red bats, tricolored bats, tend to be single roosters, whereas the little brown, big browns will tend to roost in larger colonies. And then uh, silver-haired and hoary bats are also primarily tree roosters. These are also our migratory species in Pennsylvania that are um, normally in the wintertime going south um, to farther, um, to warmer locations in the winter. And so these are the bat potential detections that uh, we could potentially find um, on Presque Isle. So a few of the kind of where this project is currently, um, been in contact with Greg Turner of the Pennsylvania Game Commission, um, submitted a special use permit. It's gonna be, I just chatted with him yesterday, looking for approval for that next week. Um, and from there, I'll be able to attach that to the Pennsylvania uh, DCNR research permit um, as well. And so here's another example of the setup of those triple high nets. Um, with that pulley system there here. Usually the triple high nets are set near waterways. You want a really um, area that has some overhead covering to kind of kind of uh, funnel the bats into the netting system so it can't be very open. And so this summer I really expect to be much of a pilot project, kind of um, finding areas that have those kind of suitable habitat features um, for the bats. And so uh, I don't have, of course, any results yet. So this is just a proposal, proposed project. And so I would just like to thank Regional Science Consortium, especially Jeanette and Jen, uh, who were, have been helpful showing me sites and um, working, um, getting to know Prescott a little bit better, and um, uh, Allegheny College uh, as well. And so I'll take any questions um, at this time. Well, we have time for some questions. Can we help? Yes. All right. Good. I'm absolutely <laughs> looking for help. I think yes. like we're going to talk, aren't we? Yes. Great. Yeah, I'd love uh, some more interaction. Mm -hmm. Especially if you get that bargain on those uh, tags. Yeah, and I mean, it would be great. Yeah, yeah I have. cheaper as we have. Yeah, yeah <laughs> exactly. Mm -hmm. um, have you. Uh, are you incorporating acoustic monitoring at all into this, or is this all? Um, I've been, I I'm, don't have any plans for that. Um, I have been at sites in the past where we also set up an acoustic monitor while we're trapping, um, but that's not in these current plans. I don't have a lot of uh, experience reading acoustic. I can set it up, but I don't have that quite experience. So if there was a student that was interested in learning that, um, the acoustic reading, that would be something I'd be interested in.
-hmm. If you're looking at this as sort of a preliminary thing, I, you know, I was trying to think, how do you decide where to where to put these up? It might be kind of fun to go out in the evening, and, mm -hmm. and in addition to your your work at the sites where you're deploying them, you just scout out to see if there might be some other places where there's a lot of bad activity. Yeah, absolutely. I hope to do that once. Now it's getting a little bit cool for that, but in the spring right. and, and get some information from the, the park rangers and people that spend a lot of time on the park if they have any insight on that as well. So anecdotally, mm -hmm. the maintenance building and then the right by the waterworks, the old pump house building right between the two ponds mm -hmm. is where bats used to roost years ago. I don't know if that's still the case, but those are good places to check. Good. Okay. I'll point them out to you on the map. Awesome. Thank you. <laughs> Are you just counting on just coincidental capture? Do they respond to playback or anything? Um, no, it's just incidental capture while they're feeding. Um, and so that's why we, we try to set them up uh, uh, in relatively open areas with a canopy where they're just like flying through catching insects. Um, if there's a little, a small stream running through, you can set it up over that stream because bats will often fly over there uh, eating the insects as they go. Um, and so just looking for those kind of clear pathways with some overhead to really kind of funnel them in. But it's all incidental. Jeanette, anything you want to say about lunch? It's good. It's, it's good. good. All right. Well, there you go. That's if you were a presenter today, it's back in your name tag. Or if you were a judge today, there should be a lunch ticket.
get to conclude our 15th year symposium, which is exciting. I, we've been saying all along, it's hard to believe it's been 15 years already. And um, Jerry uh, Covert is in the audience as well, and he started this whole process. And um, I was actually around for the first meeting and then have uh, worked on this for about 12 years. So um, it's exciting. We had a great turnout this year. We had 43 oral presentations, 45 poster presentations. Uh, we had well over, I would say 250 people here over the last three days. Um, our exhibitor tables, we had over a dozen tables of information from our vendors and our partners, um, as well as uh, just a great crowd at our evening events, so all very appreciative. All right, so before we get to the awards, um, definitely have to say thank yous. There's lots of people to thank this year. Um, let's see here. First of all, thanking DCNR. If any of you have no or saw our custodian, Jeff, running around, um, phenomenal person and was able to flip the room, set everything up so everything was perfect for us. Very appreciative of all his hard work. The Sunset Cafe that did our coffee breaks, our dinners, our uh, breakfast, our lunches. A special thanks to the judges, which I always says, you know, is one of those unnoticed, thankless jobs, but so very, very important. So I'm very thankful to those that judged the presentations, which allowed us to give out these awards this year. We also had sponsors this year that you'll notice in the proceedings. So that was able um, to help you know, support things like the t-shirts and the bags and some of the other events that went on. And then I have to thank, oh my gosh, I do this every year and I can't help it because it's so stressful. Okay, I have to thank our RSC staff team, which is amazing. And I always tell them every year that I remember when I did this by myself. And it was crazy, and the name tags and printing them out, and it was so hard, and now it's so easy. Um, at least they make it look easy. So they are just the, the team, the force behind all this. So Amber, Jen, Sean, Sarah, who's not here, um, thank you for all your amazing work. And then if everybody could just give a round of applause to Eric, because <laughs> Um, he was able to make the live streaming even bigger and better this year and which all of the talks will be online so you can go back and look at anything you might have missed. Um, and then just to mention next year, same time, same place, November 4th to November 6th will be our next symposium. Everybody has to come back and at least um, present additional information on your projects or um, listen to what is going on that's new in the consortium research collaborators and partners. <coughs> All right, so to start the awards, and if you are here, you can come on up, and if not, we will save it for you. Um, so for the first place overall undergraduate student poster presentation, Jessica Till received that award. I don't think Jessica's here, right? Okay. Jessica was um, with Mike Campbell. Do you want to accept her? No, that's the other Mike Campbell. Oh, the other. Yeah. We had this problem last <laughs> night. <laughs> that's the Penn State Baron Mike Campbell. That's just crazy, and you guys are both in biology. Okay, my apologies. So um, I, we will send that over to Penn State for Jessica, but give her a round of applause. <laughs> okay, first place overall undergraduate student poster award is presented to Cytalia Crosby from Gannon University under the advisement of Chris Dumsey and Greg Andreso. A round of applause for Cytalia. <laughs> and her project was on the comparison of fish and macroinvertebrate, macroinvertebrate communities from upstream and downstream sites on Lake Erie tributaries. All right, our next presentation is for first place overall in graduate student poster presentations. This is for Ashley Gotso um, from SUNY Fredonia under the advisement of Carrie Kuzzel and it's social vocalizations of big brown bats um, with behavioral context. So Ashley, round of applause for her. <laughs> All right, for our second place overall in undergraduate student oral presentations, it goes to Noah Colvin 
from Penn State Erie under the advisement of Lynn Beatty. Take a chill pill. Fluoxetine influences the anti-predator responses of an aquatic snail across generations. That's a great talk. Good job. <laughs> All right, our next pres uh, award is first place overall in undergraduate student oral presentations. Goes to Tyler Hosteller, and he is from Penn State Barron. He presented a cultural dependent approach to examine the effects of silver ions on bacterial compositions within local streams under the advisement of Beth Potter and also the support of the RSC team here when he did some of his sampling here as well. Okay, second place overall in graduate studies oral presentations, Azka Khan, and they're from uh, working with Chris Keller and Nancy Cardi over at Bleacom on co-infection prevalence, prevalence of anaplasma and Morelia in ticks in Erie, Pennsylvania. <laughs> And that collaboration has been going on with the RSC for about 10 years, looking at ticks and different pathogens. So, all right, and lastly, we have first place overall in graduate student oral presentations, Yersura Mansour. And Yersura is uh, under the advisement of Dr. Randy Kulza at Lee Kong University. And I am so glad you're here so I can shake one person's hand. <laughs> So we wrapped it up a couple minutes early, and um, thank you all for participating, and I'll see you guys.